Welcome to episode 26 of the MMA Rundown Podcast. Finally got the fight I've been waiting a long time for with Damian Maya and Ben Askren, so I'm going to break down what happened there and talk about Damian Maya's big win over Ben Askren, recap the UFC Singapore card, talk about Nate Diaz, who had a brief controversy with USADA where it looked like he might actually be out of the fight at UFC 244. Eventually things got rectified, uh, so talk about everything that happened with that. Then preview UFC 244, look through the whole card. We have a few really big bandweight fights that were just added to UFC 245. One of them is Jose Aldo and Marlon Moraes. The other one is Uriah Faber and Peter Yan. So I'll talk about both of those fights. Recap the two Bellator events that happened over the weekend, 231 and 232. And then talk about Greg Hardy stepping up on a little under three weeks' notice against Alexander Volkov. And talk about how that matchup looks um, and just some of the other stuff outside the cage that's that's going on before that, uh, that fight even happens. Uh, but right away, I want to get into that Ben Askren versus Damian Maia fight. This was a fight I wanted to see for such a long time. I didn't know how it was going to go. There were a lot of different things that could happen here. Uh, it was going to be interesting to see if Damian Maia was going to try to wrestle with Askren. Would they get into exchanges where we actually get to see Askren use his defensive wrestling, which is something we haven't seen in the UFC quite yet. A lot of people know that he's known as Ben Funky Askren. A lot of people like associate Funky with him, but they don't really know where Funky comes from in terms of why he was given that name. The nickname Funky, in large part, was because... In college, and I'm sure this fight made it pretty obvious, Askren's not a guy who's very explosive or, or very quick. Uh, he, he's pretty strong and static, but when, when you're not explosive and you're not quick and you're wrestling some of the top guys in the country, a lot of times they're going to be able to get, on, get in on your legs and get in really good, really tight positions on you. And so what he was able to do is he, he was able to work with a, a coach out of Missouri named Mike Ironman. Um, but between the two of them, they were able to come up with a lot of different uh, defenses that were known as funk wrestling to find ways where if someone's in on a leg, finding ways to scramble out and eventually end up on top of yourself. And because most guys don't try to take Ben Askren down, we don't get, really get to see the funk that much in MMA, or we, we don't get to see like what he was what he was known for in college as much. And I was hoping that if Damian Maia was going to start shooting some singles and shooting some doubles on him, that we'd actually get to see some defensive funk wrestling out of Askren. Um, but Maya knew coming in that the odds of him taking down Askren weren't very high, so he didn't really ever go for any takedowns against him. So unfortunately, we didn't get to see much funk wrestling from Askren. Uh, then the next question was going to be, is Ben Askren actually going to take down Damian Maia? And if he does, what's he going to do on top? We got an answer to that. Ben Askren did take down Maya a handful of times. Didn't really shoot him where he left himself open to a guillotine, which was smart. Uh, was still able to find a way to get or get Maya down a handful of different times from the clinch. Uh, another question would be, if Askren does take him down and he gets on top, how's it going to go? Typically with Damian Maya, we see him like to come up on single legs and try to finish from there. So even if Maya isn't shooting single legs on the feet, if he's going into a single leg for a sweep, then we could see some funk wrestling. Maya didn't go for any single leg sweeps. He, he decided to use submissions to sweep rather than actually um, come up on a single, which was interesting. And it was also interesting to see how effective he was at doing that. And then from there, um, if Askren was put on his back, how would, he be able, how would he be able to handle it? And we also got to find out what happened there. And it wasn't particularly well. So before I start digging a little bit deeper, one of the things that really annoyed me about what happened after this fight is that after Askren was beaten... A lot of people online were just piling on top of Askren. Some people were saying he's the most overrated fighter ever. He's one-dimensional. To me, this fight was actually a fight where, going in, I, I feel like I had a pretty good idea about what both of these guys were capable of, but I actually feel like I was more impressed, for the most part, with both of them after the, after the fight than I was before then. So for Ben Askren, first off, the idea of him being one-dimensional, is it, it's completely false. If you want to break MMA down into three dimensions, you're going to have striking, you're going to have your, your takedown slash your wrestling, and then you're going to have your Mac grappling which is typically associated with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Ben Askren has excellent wrestling, so he's excellent in the takedown dimension, but he's also excellent in the Mac grappling dimension as well. There are a lot of wrestlers who are going to get taken the fight to the ground, but then once they get there, they just kind of like hug your hips and stall. That's not Askren at all. Askren can pass. Askren's very good at hovering. He's good at um, finding ways to control your wrist and open up opportunities for ground and pound. Recently in his career, he was finding ways to catch some more submissions. So he's definitely got that dimension as well. He, he's very good on the ground. Is he as good as Damian Maia on the ground? No, he's obviously not, and we, we saw that in this fight. But he, he definitely has two dimensions of his, of his game. The question with him, though, was that third dimension, the striking. How bad was it? It's never really looked that good. We've seen him do open workouts, and it, it just doesn't look that impressive at all. In fights, he, he does just enough to be able to get inside, and then once he closes the distance, then he, he brings it into the dimensions where he's a lot better, which is the wrestling and then the Mac grappling. And in this fight... He had to stand with Damian Maia a little bit more than what we were used to seeing, so we actually got to see something from Ben Askren on the feet. Now, if I told you before the fight um, that these guys were going to stand for an extended amount of time, you probably would figure that, at least with Damian Maia, there was a period of it during his career where he, he decided that he really wanted to pick up striking and really develop his striking game, and that period didn't last super long. He got knocked out a couple times and realized, okay, look, 
I'm really good at jujitsu. I just need to find a way to make every fight a jujitsu match. And then went back into focusing squarely on jujitsu. But at least he had a time in his career where he, he really was focusing on striking, where Askren really never had that. But the final strike counts of this fight was 102 to Askren versus 84 to Maya. Uh, and then for significant strikes, it was 63 Askren versus 69 Maya. So relatively close. You could argue that Ben might have landed a, a, a few more shots, although if you want to count significant strikes, I guess you would give that, the edge to Maya. If you count total strikes, you give the edge to Askren. But what's well, really impressive to me, and it's not that it's like a, a high-level striking thing that was done there, but in the second round, Askren did made a really good read. And what that read was is that every time that Maya was throwing, he was going with his rear hand or with his left and oftentimes throwing either a, a straight cross or throwing like a, a looping overhand. And Askren made that read. So for one, he, he made an educated read on the feet. Uh, for two, he, he figured out what he had to do to actually make his opponent pay for that. And then for three, he actually executed it. So he realized that Maya was throwing that left over and over and over. He knew how to get out of the way of the left, and he knew how to counter it um, by slipping out of the way and then throwing in the right hand of his own um, when Maya would duck down to catch him with the uppercut. And for, I'd say, about two or three minutes during that second round, Askren was kind of lighting Maya up. He, he definitely battered his face and was landing a lot of really good shots there because he made a really good read and was able to actually work off of it. And that's something I would not have expected from Ben Askren. I didn't think his striking was even at that level. It's not that that's a high level, but I had set such a low bar for Askren that... It, what he did there actually passed the bar, and it, it actually showed me something that I didn't expect from him. He was able to land some nice kicks. Uh, it's not as though he had a ton of power on the kicks, but he was placing them well. He was timing them well. So f- for me, Ben Askren showed me more in his striking than I really thought he had in this fight, e- even though it still wasn't great, even though there's that moment that you see on Twitter where he went for that really sloppy spinning back fist in the third round. Th- there were definitely moments in here where that, that showed me something out of him that I didn't think he really had. As far as the Mac grappling goes... With, with him, most guys he's going to go against, they're just not going to get top position on him ever for for a handful of different reasons. For one, you're not going to take him down. For two, if he takes you down, he, he's not an easy guy to sweep. I mean, how, how are you going to come up on a sweep against him if he's going to keep wrestling through the position? That's going to be tough. So for him, he, he's got a game that's very good good for playing on top. But if you can get on top of him, at least in this fight, it, it, it showed that he, he probably hasn't drilled a whole lot off of his back. It's not as though Damian Maia passing through your guard really quickly means that you don't have a guard, but it's not as though he was really showing much. It's not like he was trying to ever like get into a closed guard. It's not like he was trying to use a butterfly guard. It's not even like he was trying to like give, give up his back and turn to his feet, which maybe is what he's used to doing with other guys, but he realized he didn't want to do that with Damian Maia because Maia's so good off the back. So at least from there, I, I guess, could have been more impressive from, Damian, or from Ben Askren, but to me... I didn't watch this fight and then feel after, wow, Askren's worse than I thought, or Askren's not that good. I actually felt like, from what I knew of Askren, this this was a pretty good performance from him, and it's just a tough match, but it didn't work out, work out that well for him. Now, for Damian Maya, my concern for him moving into, going into this fight, and I think the reason why Ben Askren was a favorite here, is because the assumption was going to be that Maya's not going to be able to take this fight to the ground. If Maya gets put on his back, he's probably going to look for some kind of single leg to sweep, and he's probably going to have difficulty finishing that single leg. And for those reasons, um, Askren's probably going to be able to just take him down late in rounds, uh, do just enough, throw just enough punches to steal the rounds and then win a decision. And in the first round, Askren takes him, takes Maya down. Maya, um, I think he looked for a leg lock in that, in that round too, wasn't able to get it. Um, Askren landed some nice shots, ended up on top where Maya was, um, had, had, had Askren sprawled on top of him. So, at least in that exchange... Yes, Maya threw up some, some submissions, but Askren was able to avoid them and was able to end the position in a dominant spot. Uh, round ends. Second round comes around, and this time Maya shoots up a triangle towards the end of the second round after he gets taken down. Askren does a good job with his posture to avoid the triangle, um, and typically one of the things you want to do when someone's posturing up and avoiding the triangle and their arm's still in is you want to switch to an omoplata, which Damian Maya did. Um, I was able to stay tight enough on that omoplata where Askren was, able, was not able to pull his arm out. Then to defend, Askren had to roll through on it. And when he rolled through, uh, Maya got on top, ended up getting into uh, Ben Askren's guard, passed it pretty quickly, got into mount. And one of the things that really impressed me with Ben Askren here, and this is something I've talked about for a while, uh, I, I talk about it as something where anytime I see a high-level jiu-jitsu guy get an MMA, it's something that I really want to see from them, and it's something that Damian Maya's done a really good job of, is that in, if, if you're a really high-level jiu-jitsu guy and you're going into MMA, one of the signs that, that tells me that you're going to be successful is if you get someone into a really good position that they never get into a better position. So if, if you get someone in mount, 
they're never going to get into a better position than being in bottom mount. So they're never going to get back to their half guard. They're never going to get back to full guard. They're never going to get away. Um, they're, they're either going to get tapped out or the round's going to end. And Maya is known for being one of these guys where if, if he passes your guard, you're just not getting it back. If he gets your back, like he's going to be on your back for the rest of the round or he's going to finish you before then. And he had it to a point where he was on top of Damian Maya. Looked like he had him, um, or Maya was on top of him. Had him in mount. Uh, looked like he almost had his back at one point. Um, but then somehow Ben Askren's able to get out of there. Um, ends up on top of Damian Maya, and then again ends up on top um, in sort of like that sprawled out position. So somehow goes from being mounted by Damian Maya to escaping and ending up on top before the end of that round. And that was just a really impressive moment for, for me, and uh, for Ben Askren, for him to escape that position, but not just escape it and like get back to like a half guard, but to escape it and end up on top. Uh, so that happens. They go into the third round. Um, and it seemed like at that point the game plan for Ben Askren was going to be staying up on the feet for the first four minutes of a round, and then for the fifth minute, um, or for the uh, final minute, then get your takedown and just do enough on top to steal the round. Asker, or Maya landed a really big straight left early on, say about like halfway through the round. And after that, um, Askren really tried to clinch with him and take him down, so he kind of broke his own game plan there. As if on top, uh, Maya goes for another leg lock, which again, this isn't something that I've seen from As- or seen from Damian Maya in MMA. I-, I haven't seen him go for a whole lot of leg attacks. Uh, but goes for another one here, gets the sweep off of it, and it, it was kind of surprising to... F- to me to see as as Askren was going over on the sweep that he didn't like try to wrestle out of the position he sort of like accepted going on his back um I don't know if he was he was still concerned about the leg lock and just wanted to make sure that he was out he cleared that first or what, what his thought process was there but either way he ends up on his back and from there gets his guard passed really quickly again Maya gets to mount Maya gets the back uh and this time Maya is able to control gets the arm across um gets the left arm across at least and um secures a one arm rear naked choke and puts Ben Askren out so for Damian Maya, what what more impressed me in this fight that I hadn't seen from him before, um, see, seeing the leg locks in MMA, seeing him use them to sweep, uh, seeing him catch that triangle of Mapata for the sweep, really impressed there. Askren's not an easy guy to sweep. I've seen him in some really high-level jiu-jitsu matches where he, he's gone against some great guys and they haven't been able to get him to budge. They haven't been able to sweep him. So for Maya to do it seemingly with ease was very impressive to me. People have to remember Ben Askren. Though he's not like a world champion in um, ADCC or IBJJF, he did an event through UWW, which is called the Grappling World Championships, and obviously their their level is nowhere near ADCC or IBJJF, but it's still a, a decent level of grappling. Um, and their rule set is more favorable to wrestling, where if you pull a guard, you give up two points. But Ashburn was actually able to win a Grappling World title there, which was like a jiu-jitsu rule set. So it, it's not as though he has bad grappling. He has very good grappling, and for Damian Maia to just sweep him with ease... Um, in this fight really impressed me. So, mine deserves a lot of credit there. Uh, it was nice to see some new wrinkles in his game, see see him use submissions off his back to, to sweep, where we're used to seeing him just go for single leg takedowns. It'll be interesting to see if he has a couple more fights moving forward, if he's fighting a guy who he's having trouble coming up to a single on. Uh, maybe he tries to do something similar to what he did with Askren here and actually like start attacking the legs and start attacking submissions and using that to sweep instead. But that's not something we've seen a lot from him up to this point. For Ben Askren... I don't know that his striking has really shown me anything where I, I want to see him striking with anyone else. It's just one of those things where he hasn't really... I think for him, the ideal matchup is going to be someone who who he can actually be able to get his hands on, take down, and control on the ground. Maya's not the kind of guy you can do that to. Lawler, he's a tough guy to take down and control. Askren learned that the hard way, uh, took a lot of damage, but then was able to get into his game. Uh, had that unfortunate ending, but I mean, he was doing well. A- after he got rocked, after he took a bunch of punches, he got back up, he was able to get... Lawler up against the fence, was able to take him down, was able to get his back, was able to threaten with a rear naked choke. As he was threatening with the rear naked choke, Lawler spun through. That's when Askren caught the bulldog choke. You can say, hey, he, he didn't actually put him out there. I agree, he didn't actually put him out there. But with that being said, things were starting to go his way after that, that first sequence that wasn't going very well for him. So at least we got to see sort of what Askren's capable of. We didn't really didn't get to see much of a fight against Masvidal, uh, but this fight here with... Damian Maia just wasn't a great style matchup for him. So for Askren, I'd like to see him fight against um, another top 15 guy, maybe someone who he, he matches up with better. Maybe a guy like a Ponta Nibio where, you know, if he can't close the distance effectively, hey, he's going to get sparked. But if he, if he can, then maybe we get to see him get back to one of those dominant performances. Because one, one of the things to note about this Saturday was, on one hand, you could you could say it's terrible for Ben Askren, and that's like, hey, look, now you're finally getting a chance to prove yourself against some of these, these top welterweights in the world, and you're losing. 
But on the other hand, if you look at how the night ended, it ended with Douglas Lima winning the Bellator uh, Welterweight Championship and a million dollars. And Douglas Lima is among the guys who Ben Askren had beaten prior to joining the UFC, and he'd beaten him pretty dominantly. So, it, granted, Lima's gotten a lot better since then, but it, it, it still shows... You, you can try to say Ben Askren's overrated, you can try to say he's one-dimensional, but in, in reality, the reason why he was rated the way he was is because he had wins over guys like Douglas Lima, and that deserves a lot of respect. He's not one-dimensional. He definitely has those two dimensions of, of wrestling and Matt Grappling. But the Matt Grappling just isn't at the level of Damian Mayan. We, we found that out, obviously, in this fight. So for me, do I feel like Ben Askren really drops a whole lot in my book after this fight? No, not really. I, I feel like I actually, from what I learned more about him, I, I guess his his ability to fight off his back is less impressive than I expected. But again, how often is he going to need to do that? Um, but then his, his striking... I pretty much had it like a zero, so now now that it's like at a two, that, that's still an upgrade from what I expected. So even even there, it's I, I feel like I'm more impressed after seeing this fight with him than I actually was um, beforehand. For Maya, we know he's only got a couple of fights left. Uh, really nice win for him. Uh, I'm sure it, it felt great for him. There's a lot of pressure leading in this fight where it's sort of like this jiu-jitsu versus wrestling matchup. Now granted, like I mentioned before, Ben Askren has very good jiu-jitsu and has done well in some jiu-jitsu competitions. Uh, is around a black belt level himself, or at least on top, has has that high level top game. Uh, Damian Maya is very good wrestler, has very good wrestling. So it's not so it's like a pure wrestling versus pure jujitsu matchup, but in a lot of people's eyes, that's what it was. So for for both of these guys, there's really a, a big opportunity to not just get a win for themselves, but also get a win for the people who are part of their sports. And for Ben At- or for Damian Maya, for him to get that win, uh, make a lot of jujitsu people proud. It, it really meant a lot to him, and it really meant a lot to a lot of people in the jujitsu community. So I really feel happy for him. As for the rest of the card, in the co-main event, we had Michael Johnson versus Stevie Ray. First two rounds uh, looked to be going Johnson's way. It's a little bit close. Uh, third round was a dominant round for Stevie Ray. Could have been a 10-8, uh, but Stevie Ray ends up winning a majority decision here. Uh, then Benil Darius runs through Frank Camacho, ends up getting him to the ground, uh, and gets a rear naked choke on him. Surreal Gon versus Dante Almaze. Gon is one of these guys where, on the feed, he's very good, especially for a heavyweight. Uh, definitely one of the top heavyweight strikers out there. His grappling... I mean, he's strong on the ground, but it's one of those things where he's got two submissions wins in the UFC, and I'm hearing people talk about, wow, everyone knows him for his striking, but wow, these submissions are really dangerous, too. And it's one of those things where it's like, if you've ever been to a jiu-jitsu tournament and you watch, like, a white belt bracket, there are going to be guys in the white belt bracket who will win all their matches by submission. And you could say, hey, look, we're watching this guy, and this guy's submitting everyone, and wow, he must be really good on the ground. But you know that, like, when that guy goes back to train the day after, that they're going to be, like, blue belts half his size or pearl belts half his size who are just going to tear him, tear him to shreds. And with Surreal Gone, I kind of get that vibe with him where it's like, when I'm watching him on the ground with the guys that he's fighting, like, they're not really offering much resistance. So while he is getting his submissions, like, it's not as though he, what he's doing is incredibly technical and it's not like what they're doing to defend is all that impressive. So yes, he's getting the submission wins, but like the guys he's doing against and how they're, how they're handling it, it just, it really isn't all that impressive to me. So yes, he gets this heel hook here, but like the way he dropped to it from top of guard was sort of odd. Uh, and didn't seem all that tight. Seemed like Mays could have rolled through if he if he had to. Granted, the, the fence was in the way, but it's not even like he tried to roll through. Didn't really try to come up on it either. It was just kind of bizarre how he just kind of like laid there, watched his leg get cranked, and then was like, oh crap, oh crap, he's got a heel hook on me now. I guess I got to tap. Uh, so it's a good for, good win for Gon. You don't really want to like take it away from him and say, well, Gon's Gon shouldn't be getting these wins. He, he definitely was winning this fight. He, he was definitely the better fighter, but I would not convince myself that Cyril Gon is like a threat on the ground on top of being a threat on the feet. Like, he knows what submissions are, and he has, like, a rough idea of what they are, but to me, he, he's not a very high-level grappler. Pretty high-level striker, though, so... If you're looking at this guy and you're saying, oh, wow, like, this guy's dangerous in all areas, I, I wouldn't say that. He's a dangerous striker. Um, if he's dominating someone on the feet and they're just kind of exhausted and want to get out of there, he'll find ways to finish him on the ground, but I don't... I would not say that he's a high-level grappler, and there are guys in this division who actually can grapple at a pretty decent level. And if the fight goes to the ground there, I would not favor Cyril Gon. Uh, one of those guys is a guy we'll talk about later in Alexander Volkov. Now, Volkov's not like a, a black belt in, in jiu-jitsu. I think he's a brown belt right now. But he, he's the kind of guy where if Gon took him down, like, what seems to be an effective submission game probably would not look all that effective um, against a guy like Volkov or, or even like some of the other high-level guys. Now, granted, there's there seems to be a lack of high-level jiu-jitsu guys in the heavyweight division. There seems to be like a, a lack of high-level just... <laughs> martial artists in general in the heavyweight division, but what I've seen out of Gon, on, on the feet, pretty good. On the ground, yes, he's getting the finishes, but it's not like it's through amazing technique or anything like that, or like really tight and really well-drilled well, well drilled technique. 
Uh, it, it just seems more like his opponents are just not offering very good uh, very good um, resistance at all. Then we saw Muslim Salikov versus Lorena Staropoli. Uh, Salikov just landed a ton of huge shots. I don't know how Staropoli was able to survive this. Sort of weird in that it, you had two 30-26s and one 29-28. I don't know where the 29-28 came from, but really dominant performance by Salikov. Called out Li Jingling after. That'd be an interesting fight to see, but I don't know that Jingling wants it, given that Salikov's not ranked. On the prelims, we had Random Marcos versus Ashley Yoder. Marcos got a split decision win here. We had Rafael Fiziev from Kyrgyzstan versus Alex White. Fiziev just put it on White the entire time. Um, ends up getting the unanimous decision win here. White showed a lot of toughness and was able to land some of his own shots, but really just pretty dominant performance by Fiziev. Uh, we had Mosar Evloviev versus Enrique Barzola. Uh, unanimous decision for Evloviev. Um, Sergey Pavlovich versus Maurice Green in a battle of top 15 heavyweights, which if you'd watched it, you probably wouldn't know why. But again, heavyweight division is not terribly deep right now. But Pavlovich was able to get the win here. We had Loma Lukbunmi get a split decision win over Alexander Albu. And then Rafael Pessoa get a unanimous decision win over Jeff Hughes. So the next event that's going to be coming up is going to be UFC 244. Main event will be Nate Diaz versus Jorge Masvidal. And for a short period of time, it looked as though that Nate Diaz fight was not going to happen. Diaz posted to Twitter uh, just this long thing in Notes app where he was saying, hey, look, I don't do steroids. People who do steroids are, are pussies. Um, they're saying that I took a Tatin supplement. Uh, that's bullshit. I just eat whole foods. I'm a vegan. Like This, this can't possibly be happening. I'm not going to play around with your games. I'm not going to stay quiet about this. This is absolutely ridiculous. And in the hours that followed, um, there were a lot of people, Dustin Poirier especially. Now, granted, I think it's worth mentioning that Poirier, one of the videos that he posted was him on a hospital bed, clearly drugged up after a surgery. So what Poirier did, I think, deserves criticism, but I think it's also worth noting that Poirier was also pretty drugged up, so probably wasn't him in his best moment of judgment, but he was just ripping on ideas and saying, hey, you're a pussy, you're a cheater. Um... But eventually, uh, USADA finally released a statement on this, and they, they exonerated Nate Diaz and said that w what happened here was an adverse, or I don't remember if it was adverse or w what the specific wording was, but that the finding wasn't, it wasn't correct, that it was from a, a po possibly tainted supplement. Now, granted, I don't know how they can know it's from a tainted supplement. I'm, as far as I know, these tests don't measure, they, they don't tell you what something comes from, they just tell you what's there. So they'll tell you, like, there's a metabolite of X. They don't say there's a metabolite of X coming from Y and Z. They just know what it is. So I don't know how they could say definitively that's a, that's a tainted supplement. But the amount of the substance that was in Nate Diaz, I think, was, like, a thousand times less than, like, what the, the threshold is for it to be, um, for, for someone to pop for it. So even still, it's not as though he, like, failed a drug test. It's just they found something in his system that shouldn't have been there, but... I guess their reasoning was the reason why it was such a low amount is it would have had to have been a tainted supplement. I guess that's their reasoning. But either way, Nate Diaz is exonerated. He's clean. It seems like the fight's still on. And so for that reason, everything's going to be good to go. As far as how I think this fight's going to go between Masvidal and Diaz, it, it's a tough one for me to pick because I, when, when you watch Diaz, he's a guy who takes a lot of really hard shots and he's able to keep moving forward and he's able to keep, a, keep heavy pressure the entire time. Even in fights where he gets dropped early, he's still able to recover and find a way to keep fighting through. We think about that second fight with McGregor where he got dropped three times in the first round, uh, but then was able to put a heavy pace on McGregor. McGregor, uh, in the third round of that fight, looked like he almost was, was out of there, really had to do everything he could to survive and catch his breath so he could put up a decent fight in the fourth and fifth rounds. So even if Masvidal lands early on Nate Diaz and puts him down, if he's not able to finish him, Diaz is still going to find a way to come back and still keep a heavy pressure on him and... If this fight does go to a decision, and it is a five-round fight, which typically five-round fights are going to favor someone like Diaz, that's going to be tough for Mas at all. Now, with that being said, when you watch the Pettis versus Diaz fight, there are a lot of openings there that Diaz left. He kept his hands down at times when he was marching forward, and Pettis was landing some heavy shots against him. And you have to wonder if Mas is able to land similar shots as he can be able to put Diaz down and even put Diaz out. So, to me, the, the question here is going to be, I'm, I'm going to assume that Mas is going to land some heavy shots on Diaz, I'm going to assume that Nate Diaz is going to continue to walk forward as long as he's got his consciousness. The consciousness. The question is going to be, is Masvidal going to land heavy enough shots to put Diaz down? And if so, is he going to be able to finish him on the ground? Because if there is no finish in this fight, I don't know that I see Masvidal winning a decision here. To me, it seems like either Masvidal is going to get a KO or a TKO, or Nate Diaz is going to win a decision or eventually break Masvidal later on the, later on the fight and uh, get a win that way. 
So for me, it, it, in that way, because I, I can really see clear paths to victory for both of them, I don't want to bet a fight like this because it, it's just one where if I put money down on Diaz, I'm be like, oh, but he's going to leave those openings for Masvidal. Masvidal's going to land. And then when you watch the fights, every time Masvidal lands something heavy, you're like, oh, crap, why did I make that bet? And then if you bet on Masvidal, then it's like every time he lands something heavy and then Diaz eats it and keeps moving forward, it's like, oh, crap, why did I bet against Diaz? Like, this is a five-round fight. What am I doing here? So just a tough fight to bet either way. But I think for that reason, that's what makes it so compelling. And beyond just being an interesting matchup just from an entertainment standpoint and these guys being entertaining guys, uh, I think from a style matchup, it's also a really entertaining fight. So I can't wait to see it. Coming event, we have Kellen Gaslam versus Darren Till. A lot of people have said that Darren Till made a terrible decision by taking this fight. It goes both ways. It, it, if he loses, it looks like a terrible decision because then he's on a three-fight losing streak and potentially a three-fight um, KO losing streak. But if he wins, then getting a win over Kellen Gaslam, who just had a five-round war with the current champion, uh, that, that puts you in a really good position in the middleweight division and doesn't put you too far away from a title fight if that's what you think you're ready for. So good opportunity for Darren Till. Gaslam's going to be a guy who, though he's going to have a reach disadvantage, he showed with that um, out of sign fight that he's really good at finding a way to get in and get into his boxing range and land his shots. It's only going to be a three-round fight, which in in ways could be good for good for each of them. For Darren Tell, if he can keep Kelvin at the end of his punches and just kind of like pick him apart and maybe even make it like a bit of a boring fight, you think back to the Darren Tell versus Wonder Boy fight that really propelled him into that title shot and really put him the top, put him on the top, on top of um, some really big cards. If he fights in a similar style there and maybe doesn't worry so much about getting the knockout and just tries to outpoint Kelvin, I think there's reason to believe he could definitely get the win here. If he starts making, mixing it up and let Kel, letting Kelvin get into range, that's where he could definitely have some problems. Um, but to me, this isn't a fight where it's obvious either way he's going to win. I, I think I'd probably lean towards Kelvin because I think Kelvin is going to be able to find a way to get in range and he's going to be able to land some heavy shots. And I don't know that Darren's going to have the chin to take him. It is worth noting that Darren's going up a weight class. He's not having the same weight cut. That being said, like I mentioned with James Vick, Sometimes when fighters move up weight classes, they walk around at the same weight that they were for the lighter weight class, and it's just 15 pounds less, less of a cut. Other times when they move up weight classes, they also start eating more, and they get bigger as well. So if you were walking around at, say, 190 pounds when you used to fight at 170, maybe now you're walking around at, like, 200 pounds when you're fighting at 185. So it, it's not always a given that you're going to have an easier cut or that things are going to be a whole lot better for you. So we'll, we'll see what the case is with Darren Till, how much bigger he's gotten since he moved up to middleweight, and if, if there's still a really tough weight cut on him. But to me, this isn't... A lot of people seem to be counting Darren Till out already and think this is just a terrible fight for him. He's going to get sparked really quick. I don't I don't know that I see it that way. Till's an excellent striker. He showed that in, his, in the fight against Wonderboy, and I think this is going to be an, a good opportunity for him to really remind everyone how good he is, and if he does get the win, he'll be able to put himself in title contention pretty quickly, and, and if he has a dominant win at that, uh, the, the matchup between him and Adesanya is going to be a style matchup that people might actually really want to see and might want to see pretty soon. Uh, speaking of Wonderboy, though, he is going to be fighting against Vicente Luque, which is a, a really interesting fight. Wonderboy is a guy where, for a while, uh, between his kickboxing fights and his MMA fights, he, he's taken a lot of shots over the years, and his chin has gone a little bit. Um, obviously, his most recent fight was a KO loss to Anthony Pettis, a fight that he was winning for the most part. So with Luque, Luque is a tough guy. Luque could definitely take some shots and land his own. So, so to me, if Luque doesn't land the big shot, and this fight goes to a decision, I think you're probably going to have to favor Wonderboy. Um, but Luke oftentimes does find ways to land the shot, and the question is going to be if he does land a big shot on Wonderboy and gets him down, uh, what's going to happen from there? He's going to be able to knock him down with a punch, catch him with a dart choke, and finish him on the ground. That's a possibility. Uh, to me, uh, another fight that's tough to pick because, again, when you're betting fights, usually the first question you want to ask yourself is if this goes to a decision, who do I think is going to win? And usually the person who you'd pick for that is the guy you want to bet on, and I think in that case you would want to pick Wonderboy Thompson, but... I, I can definitely see Luke finding his moments. I can definitely see Luke finding Thompson's chin. And if he does that, it could be a quick night for him. And Luke could get a really big win for his career here. Uh, next fight on the card is Derek Lewis, Lewis versus Luke Ivanov. Uh, Lewis, he had a, a, a couple of surgeries after his last fight. So I think this is his first fight back since then. So if the surgeries went well, this could be great for him because he, he was dealing with a lot of injuries um, going into his most recent fights. And if this is like a refreshed and healthy Lewis, then we could be seeing a great Derek Lewis here against Blagoj Ivanov. Um, if he still got some physical ailments, I think he, even the Derek Lewis who fought JDS would be a really tough matchup for Ivanov and probably wins that fight. So I think Lewis is probably still going to win this matchup. But we may see an especially good Lewis if, if those surgeries went well and if he's, if he's feeling a lot better. So I think for that reason, it's a definitely an interesting fight to watch. And for whatever reason, Barry does the fifth fight on the card and the first fight on the, on the um, main card. 
uh, a, a fight that a lot of people really want to see, myself included, is Kevin Lee versus Gregor Gillespie. For Gregor, this is an opportunity where if he gets a win here, he, he really gets to work his way towards the top. He, I'm sure he gets a top 10 spot after this in, in the lightweight division. Probably is a fight or two away from a title, especially in the UFC where a lot of times fans, the fights they want to see most aren't always like number one versus number two so much as it's like who's number one and who's going to offer the toughest matchup for number one, and that's the fight they want to see. And a lot of people feel as though Gregor Gillespie could be the guy who offers the toughest matchup for Khabib Nurmagomedov, a former Division One national champion wrestler. Uh, Gregor Gillespie is. Um, excellent grappler, hard guy to hold down. Um, does all the same stuff that Khabib does in terms of taking guys down, ragdolling them, um, advancing position. Granted, not a, he, he doesn't do it at the same level as Khabib. But with that being said, if he's able to win the wrestling exchanges with Khabib, he can end up on top of Khabib. Um, so people are wondering, hey, if these two fight, how's it going to go? And for Gregor, if he gets a win over Kevin Lee, it might not be too long before he's a guy that a lot of fans are demanding to see fight Khabib Nurmagomedov. So this fight could could be huge. And it could give the guy who I think some people view as the toughest stylistic, stylistic matchup for Khabib, it, it could really fast-track him towards a fight with Khabib. So for that reason, it's really, really exciting. And then for Kevin Lee, you, you got to give him credit for taking on a lot of the toughest guys that are out there. This, I believe, is his first fight with TriStar, which is a, a gym that a lot of people wanted to see him at. I know Joe Rogan was talking about this for a while. He felt as though Faraz Hobby would be a perfect coach for Kevin Lee. So it'll be interesting to see how he looks after one camp with TriStar, um, if he's able to pull off a really big upset here and beat the undefeated Gregor Gillespie. And that's great for him, and that pushes him back into a, a position where he might be a couple fights away from a fight with Khabib. Because for, for him, then he could then tell the story of, hey, you know, like I, I've been improving. I've been working my way towards the top. Had some bumps in the road, but now I'm now I'm with TriStar, now I'm with GSP's team. Uh, now I'm a new fighter, and now I'm fighting at my, at my best. And I think a lot of people would actually believe him there, especially if he has a win over Gregor, especially if he gets another win over a top five lightweight. So for, for each of these guys, a, a win here really could put them pretty close to a title fight, even though both of them are ranked towards the bottom of the top ten right now. So for that reason, it, it, it's a great fight, it's a compelling fight, and for the winner of the fight, it, it's definitely going to fast-track them and put them in a position where they're not all that far away from a title fight, in my opinion. On the prelims, uh, you have what could potentially be a light heavyweight title eliminator between Corey Anderson and Johnny Walker. Dominic Reyes did a really good job of cementing himself as a top contender, but with this fight still happening, with recency bias being a really big thing in, in MMA, if either Corey Anderson or Johnny Walker have a great performance here, that may be enough for them to steal the title fight away from Dominic Reyes and earn themselves a title shot. Uh, it's one of those fights where, again, if, if I told you it's going to decision, you're probably going to bet on Anderson. Um, but Walker is a really dangerous guy, really explosive. There's a lot of unorthodox strikes, and for that reason, Anderson could definitely get caught coming in. We don't really know the extent of uh, Johnny Walker's takedown defense, how he's going to be if he gets clenched up with. Um, how does he defend takedowns in open space? Really, We haven't seen a ton of him in the UFC. It's just been a lot of really quick fights for him. So this could be a fight where we actually get to see it, it go for a while. We actually get to see um, a little bit more of where Johnny Walker's technique is at rather than just seeing him land these unorthodox and really quick knockouts that we're used to see- seeing from him. Then we have Shane Burgos versus Makwan Americani. Burgos is a very good boxer, um, really good on the feet. Makwan, pretty good wrestler, decent on the feet, um, pretty explosive, and has some attacks on the ground as well. So it'll be interesting to see here. I think you, you probably have to lean lean towards Burgos, but Makwan's pretty dangerous, so it's still going to be a pretty exciting fight. Can't imagine this one being a boring fight. Uh, if Burgos keeps it on the feet, then we're going to see a lot of really good boxing. If Makwan gets it down, uh, probably a lot of explosive transitions on the ground. So either way, pretty excited there. And then we get to see the return of Edmund Shabazian versus Brad Tavares. Um, Shabazian's a guy who a lot of people think has potential to be a, a future title contender. Tavares is sort of getting into that role where he's he, he's a guy who you kind of have to prove yourself against to to make it into the next make it into that next echelon. Uh, Tavares had fought in the main event against Israel Adesanya. Does a really big test for Adesanya. Adesanya ends up winning that fight, um, moves along, and a few fights later is fighting for the belt and now is the current champion. I guess the hope for Shabazzian would be if he gets the win here, then he would also be a few more fights, a couple in the top 15 before he starts working his way towards the title shot as well. And then for the early prelims, we have Yuri Zinio Roizenstroik versus Andre Arlovsky. Uh, we have Caitlin Chukagian versus Jennifer Maya. Please put uh, please put your TV on mute while you're watching that fight. Uh, Lyman Good versus Chance Rekunter. And um, Julio Arce versus Hakim Dewadu. Next thing to talk about are the two big Bantamweight fights that were announced. So we have... Jose Aldo versus Marlon Moraes, which is just an absurd fight. Um, first off, Aldo cutting down to 35, I think, seems like a really odd decision. He, he posted some pictures of him looking really slim. 
it, I don't know what his weight is though, because it, it's great that he's looking really really trim right now. But if you're looking really trim and your weight's at like 148, then like where are the 13 pounds gonna come that you're gonna have to cut? If your weight's like 140, then okay, great. Like five pounds is an easy cut. So we know that he's looking trim. I don't know what kind of water cut he's gonna have to cut on top of that though. So we still don't know what kind of weight cut he's gonna have ahead of him for him to make 135 from Rice. Uh, what we saw in his last fight was really explosive. Look, looked really good in the first round against Cejudo before starting to fade later on. What's interesting to me about this fight is that with it happening now in 2019, one of the things I've noticed a lot from Jose Aldo that's kind of been disappointing but not all that surprising is that early on in his career, he used to throw a lot of leg kicks and he used to throw them really heavy. And o- over time, that, that hasn't happened as frequently. And I think a big part of the... A big reason for that is that when you throw a leg kick and when you throw a hard leg kick... If I land it on your, if you check it, if I land it on your knee, if I land it on your elbow, oftentimes the person throwing the kick is going to be hurt worse than the person who takes the kick. And for him, for someone who's thrown so many hard kicks over his career, I'm sure he's taken a lot of damage to that leg, damage to the shin, damage to the feet. And for that reason, oftentimes that makes you a little bit more gun shy about throwing the kicks as often. And what we've seen at Featherweight is he just hasn't thrown the leg kicks as much as we're used to seeing from him. And if the leg kicks aren't going to be a part of his arsenal here against Marlon Marais, I, I don't see Marais having that issue where Marais isn't going to throw the kicks. So, is it possible that Aldo's going to have the better boxing than Marais? Definitely possible. But if Aldo's worried about throwing kicks, or if he's reserved about throwing his kicks, and Marais isn't, that's going to put him at a bit of a disadvantage, and Marais is not going to be afraid to throw at him, and not, not afraid to throw at him hard. Both of these guys are black belts on the ground. I don't know that the grappling is going to really play too much of a role here. I think it's going to be more of a striking match. Um, but if Marais has, has use to the kicks and isn't as concerned with them as, as Jose Aldo is, there's a chance that Marais might be able to to land either a big shot that puts Aldo out, or at least be able to outland him and do enough to get the win here and win a decision. So, to me, going to be a very interesting fight to see. But the big question mark heading in is where's Jose Aldo going to be at with his kicks? How how willing is he going to be to throw kicks against Marlon Marais? And I I think the answer to that question is really going to tell you who, who's probably going to win this fight. Other fight to watch for is going to be Peter Yan versus Uriah Faber. Faber gets a quick win over Ricky Simone in his return and somehow earns himself a shot against a top five guy in the division. Uh, if he gets the win here, then great for him. He's going to likely find himself in a, in a trial fight pretty, sw- pretty soon. If he doesn't, then uh, I guess we're going to start to get to the point where we're going to find out really where, where does Uri Faber fit into the bandwagon division? Like where, where should he actually be ranked? Now, for me, th- this is just a terrible matchup for him. You look at Faber's last fight before he retired. It was against Jimmy Rivera. And Rivera was able to defend against all the takedowns, uh, forced him to do a striking match and just outstruck him from there. If this fight stays on the feet, I don't see how Uri Faber outstrikes Peter Yan. And is Uri Faber going to be able to take Peter Yan down? I don't see any reason to believe so. Yan's shown really good takedown defense up to this point. Uh, actually has some pretty good takedowns himself. If he does get taken down, he's very hard to hold down. So to me, this this fight looks like one where it's going to be on the feet for the most part, and Yan's boxing is just much better than Faber's is, so... Unless Faber lands a really big shot, I, I just see Peter Yan boxing him up. I don't know whether or not he gets the finish, but I think this should be a pretty dominant win for Peter Yan. And whenever they do the release of the betting line on it, it, it seems like a pretty smart fight to, to put somebody down on Peter Yan. Uh, next fights to talk about are Bellator. So Bellator had two events this week. They had Bellator 231, which is headlined by Frank Mirror and Roy Nelson. In that fight, Frank Mirror got the unanimous decision win over Roy Nelson. We also had Phil Davis get a KO win over Carl Albrechtson. Ed Ruth had a split decision win over Jason Jackson where he got dropped in the third round. Looked like Jackson was going to finish him or found a way to get back up. Um, but because it's a 10-9 scoring system, Ruth was able to bank the first couple rounds even though he lost the third round pretty dominantly. Uh, then we had Beck Rawlings getting um, knee barred by Il- Ilara Joanne, who is now 1-2 in MMA. Rawlings is now 7-9. and nine. Kind of crazy to think that Beck Rawlings was, at one point was considered one of the best uh, female fighters in the world, but I guess the female divisions have a long way to go and I guess no big surprise there that the UFC cut her. Now she's 7-9. Built enough of a name where it was worth Bellator signing her, but just ha- hasn't really shown to be that great of a fighter. She's, she's been working in bare knuckle boxing and trying to find a bit of an itch there, but MMA really hasn't been that great for her. And then we had a no contest between Jake Hager and Anthony Garrett. And then for the prelims, uh, I don't know if there was anything really worth bringing up there. For UFC 232, or not UFC, for Bellator 232, main event, uh, a battle of Roy McDonald and Douglas Lima. As I mentioned before, Douglas Lima won Ben Askren's former opponents. A- Askren had a pretty big win there. So, again, if you're going to rip on Askren and try to say he's overrated, just keep in mind that Douglas Lima, who I'm talking about right now, is, is a guy who Askren has a win over and a pretty dominant win at that. So for people to give Askren credit for that, it, it's definitely not out of line. 
But Lima gets a unanimous decision win here. First round was kind of close, but from there, Lima was able to take over. Uh, leg kicks were very effective in the first fight. Uh, brought him back in the second fight, was very effective with him again, and was able to get the win here over Rory McDonald. Paul Daly gets a knockout over Sada Wad. Patrick Mix, who's a guy who I'd really like to see against some of the top guys in the division because he's looked really impressive so far. Uh, excellent at getting guys down and taking their back, and once he gets your back, he's really hard to get off you and really good at finding submissions. Uh, but he's able to get a Sula left stretch uh, on Isaiah Champ after getting Isaiah Chapman's back. And then Nick Newell uh, had some good moments, but ends up losing to Manny Murrow, which was a bit of a surprise. Uh, and the fight on the prelim, I guess, was of note, was Kimbo Slice's son getting a win by TKO, although it looks like that may or may not be at risk of getting taken back because it looks like there were a lot of shots landed to the back of the head. So if his opponent does um, raise a stink to that, or raise a stink about it to the commission, there's, there's a chance it does get overturned. Last thing I want to talk about is Greg Hardy. So he took a fight with Alexander Volkov on short notice. Volkov was supposed to be fighting Junior Dos Santos. J- JDS has just a terrible infection in his leg, has to pull out. And Francis Ngannou had said that he wanted that fight in Russia, Don't, doesn't get it. Greg Hardy does get it. And for Hardy, it's a really big opportunity in that he, he's a guy who has been fighting a lot of the guys who are lower ranked in the heavyweight division. There are a lot of fans who absolutely hate him and want to see him get knocked out. And now that he's fighting a guy like Volkov, this could be the perfect opportunity for them to finally get what they want. For Hardy, if he does get the win here, it, it could be big for him for a couple of reasons. For one, obviously, if you get a win over a guy who's ranked in the top eight right now, then that, that puts you in the rankings, and it, it, it sort of fast-tracks you to a title shot. Now, from what I've seen out of Greg Hardy, I have no reason to believe that he deserves that. Uh, his skill set really isn't all that impressive. He looked a little bit, a little bit better than that Sassoli fight. Uh, still wasn't really stringing his punches together, but at least was doing a better job of at least like managing range. I, I haven't seen a whole lot of his grappling, but his grappling looked terrible in the fight that he had back in January. Um, I'm trying to remember who that was against. Um, got the tattoos, had the takedown, got knee in the head. I, I'm sure I'm sure it'll come back to me, but um, either way, he, he just had a complete lack of a guard there. So I, I find it hard to believe that his grappling's a whole lot better now um, in November than it was back in January. Striking... We're seeing some small improvements, but again, no no real major improvements. And to be fighting a guy like Volkov, who's a significantly better striker than him, Volkov's a brown belt on the ground, very good on the ground. Uh, and his fight with Derek Lewis was downing most of that fight up until like the last 20 seconds. Um, but it had taken Lewis down and taken his back, uh, was controlling from there. It, to me, there's no reason to believe from a skill standpoint that Greg Hardy's going to win this fight. If he does win this fight, though, for one, it puts Greg Hardy in the rankings, but for two, and I think what may be more significant, and if this story gets told properly, if it happens, is that if Greg Hardy comes into the UFC and then within three years is fighting and beating, more, more specifically is beating top 15 guys, what that could do for a lot of other former NFLers, and you have to think with the NFL, this is a sport where oftentimes players are getting into the league around 22 years old. The average player is going to last about three to four years, so they're out of the league at around 26. If you have Greg Hardy setting a precedent that, hey, look, in, in three years, you can go from being a, a top uh, NFL player, or you, you can go from being a pro football player to a top-ranked UFC fighter within about three years, you're probably going to see a lot of guys who are, who are at 26 years old who aren't getting a, a call from any other NFL teams anymore, and they're saying, you know what, Greg Hardy did in about three years, why can't I do this, why can't I try to do this? Part of it has to do with the heavyweight division not being that, that, um, that skilled right now, but hey... If Greg Hardy sets a precedent there, you could really start to see a lot of other, a lot of other uh, NFL, um, trying to, NFL veterans, I guess you would call them, but former for NFL players, who decide, you know what, I, I've seen what Greg Hardy's done, I think I can do something similar, and you may find that in a few years after this fight, if Greg Hardy gets the win, that we start to see a bunch of NFL guys start to come over to MMA and start to work their way into the UFC, and I think in that way, that'd be pretty cool, and be, it'd be pretty neat. But with that being said, from a technical standpoint, I don't see any reason to believe that Greg Hardy's going to do anything remotely close to winning this fight. Maybe he's going to be able to land a few punches that might push back Volkov and sort of put him on his heels at, a, at one point or another, but to me, I, I just see Volkov fighting from range, landing some big kicks, hurting Hardy, um, getting into a clinch, taking him down, and just dominating him on the ground. So to me, this this should be a pretty easy win for Alexander Volkov. Still waiting to find the odds on this, so I can bet a bunch of money on Volkov, but if Hardy does get the win here, not only is it going to piss a lot of people off, because a lot of people really want to see him lose, and they're going to hate to see him beat a guy like Volkov, but it, it could bring in a really big influx of professional athletes from other sports, specifically football, into the heavyweight division. And I, I, I guess in that way, it could potentially be a good thing, you could argue, because there's a real lack of talent at heavyweight right now. And we, we just need we need something to really push some, some of the big, strong 
athletic guys out of other sports and into MMA. And if that's what it takes, I mean, hey, that's not the prettiest way to go about it, but that's one way that you could potentially go about it. But that'll cover it for this week. That that's all for um, for this week. Obviously, we've got UFC 244 next week, so I'll be recapping that event and uh, talking about the other uh, events that are are to come afterwards in uh, episode 27, which will be next week.